We're getting the live stream. Yeah. So we're on. Hey, everybody. That's right. We are on. So who's going to be uh, our first person chiming in today? Oh, uh, I tried to beat him. It's always Richard Grace. <laughs> Richard has maybe he maybe he's got like some sort of software that lets him log on first. I don't know. Maybe pretty good. It's nice to have fans who want to, want <laughs> yeah, to be right there. That's right. I'm going to adjust my lighting here a little bit. Nope. He's just that quick. <laughs> he's just that quick. He says, okay, he's well. just that quick. Hey, Book. Book Davies is on. Howdy Davies do. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about real and fake today. Yeah. And how do you know what's real and how do you know what's fake yes real and fake are important things mm -hmm. and uh gosh now i'm getting now i'm getting clear mm. i have some new lights in the office new lights uh, huh? some of my old lights burnt out and so i replace them with oh that's much better i replace them with new leds Hmm. You know, the new LED bulbs, uh, which are a higher Kelvin temperature. They're a brighter blue-white light than blue -white. What I had before. And uh, they're a lot more intense. They're the same wattage equivalent, they say. They say that blue light's not good for you. And this is a, a, a bright white. It's, it's, I would have to get a light meter measure the Kelvin temperature, but I would guess... It's somewhere up in the 52 to 5,500 Kelvin. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a nice light for a work light because it's, it's, it's bright, it's a good task light. But when I'm, uh, when I'm on video, I have one that's right over my head and I get, oh my gosh, I get glare. <laughs> so I have to... <laughs> <laughs> have to turn on lights that surround me and get rid of the one that glares. So it's all an experiment. It's a live show, right? Well, Harold Locke says, I have blue light burn macula. That does not sound good. No. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that sounds awful. Yeah. One is tempted to ask, how did this happen? Was this, uh... oh golly, that just sounds terrible. Yeah. They say blue lights, like I said, they say it's bad. You might want to replace those LEDs. I know a lot of folks use uh, a blue light filter on their smartphones and tablets. Right. Uh, my desktop monitors don't have any such a feature that I know of. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, kind of they're not the latest and greatest. They're <laughs> what Doc can afford. <laughs> so, uh, anyway,
Well, hello, everybody. This is Scott Roberts and Daniel Barth here um, on the 19th episode of How Do You Know? Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the subject is real or fake. And uh, so, you know, reading through the study guide, which you can download in this link, and by the way, you can download uh, uh, Dr. Barth's entire book, Astronomy for Ed Educators there, it's all free. Um, you'll, uh, you'll learn a lot, um, but uh, the critical thinking that's in this particular study guide really made me kind of like think a lot more about uh, how I think about things and how I use facts, okay, to support some of my conversations and how I'm trying to explain uh, what I know about the universe, you know, so, uh, but in fact, as, as uh, we've learned, uh, <laughs> the only real fact is, is that uh, your facts, science facts may be yesterday's news at, at some point. So, right. So you have to keep up on it and you have to apply some, you know, if you're getting involved in science, you have to apply yourself. And that's, that's what uh, Daniel will go over today. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I want to uh, start out saying that this was kind of a unplanned program. This this kind of current events drive me, and uh, I've said this for years as an astronomy teacher. The sky is my laboratory, but I don't control it. <laughs> and we've had interesting discussions about that before. What happened is earlier this week, full moon time. And uh, here in the Ozarks, it's harvest time for people with hay crops and other things like that. And when it's harvest time here, the rising moon is always an orange yellow. I had, uh, I've had many, well, it's fires in Canada. And I like, well, you know what? Um, hello, here in the Midwest, uh, when it's harvesting time and the agriculture gets going, we put a lot of dust into the air and we always get a very orange yellow hue moon right on the horizon at this time of year, it's regular as clockwork, no fires are necessary. But anyway, my wife was out on the porch looking across the valley. We have a lovely hilltop home here at the ranch in the Ozark Mountains. And she said, oh, Dan, come on out. It looks like Jupiter is rising. And I said, it's a little early for Jupiter. She said, no, it's the moon, but it looks like Jupiter. And my, my first reaction was, no, it doesn't. What are you, what are you telling me? And so I went outside and I'm going to uh, share this screen with everybody. And I went outside and I was greeted with this. And I was like, that's stunning. And at yeah, first, there's the red spot, equatorial belt. Yeah. <laughs> right? You, right. You've got the northern equatorial belt. You've got the red spot down there in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, it looks like Jupiter. This photo that I'm showing you is a cell phone shot. I just ran inside, I grabbed my cell phone, which is a few years old. It's not the latest and greatest either. And yeah. I click, click, I, I took two or three photos and this is about the best one. And so what we're getting here is uh, a beautiful rising full moon. It's yellow, orange in color because of dust in the atmosphere. Dust in the atmosphere absorbs preferentially short wavelengths of light, blue and green, and it leaves the red, orange, yellow band passes through more easily. And we have some lenticular clouds. And what's interesting, this photograph, the sky was dark enough. We're looking east here, obviously. Mm -hmm. The sky's dark enough that uh, it's twilight time and you can't see the cloud bands anymore. But with the moon basically backlighting the cloud bands, you get this lovely when uh, these laminar clouds, sorry, not lenticular, but laminar clouds, and they're shadowing the moon. And it's just, it's this beautiful effect. And so I, I said to my, my wife, I said, you know what? I, I, I should post this and say ancient scrolls predicted that Jupiter would look as big as the moon. <laughs> and I kind of, ha ha, evil chuckle. Ancient emails anyways. <laughs> Oh no, that was Mars. That's right. Mars right. would come out. Mars well, is going to be as big as the full moon almost this, every this, August, right? Right. Well, this started back, the earliest I saw it was back in about 2003. We, 2000, between 2001 and 3, we had some of the best oppositions of Mars ever. I mean, yes. 10,000 year period, these were the best. And they were, they were quite amazing. 
and someone started a hoax. Oh, special ancient oracles predict the moon, Mars will <laughs> appear as big as the full moon in the sky. Your only chance in your life to go see this. And, right. you know. I actually know the backstory of this. So, do you? Yeah. Okay. Please. Finish, finish your part and I'll tell the backstory. Okay. Well, <clears throat> daddy always told me that the truth is slipperier than a bar of wet soap, but stupid sticks to the wall every single time. <laughs> and I've often, I often use this that's old phrase, a quaint phrase in, in my classes. And I've thought a lot, why do, why do things like this stick where you tell people how relativity works or any, anything, why the moon is a particular, why the moon and the sun are the same size in the sky. And we've thought about a lot of this over years, but this particular Mars will be as big as the full moon. Some people have told me that it appears in a telescope to be as big as the full moon does to your eye. I don't know what the actual story is. I do that, know that is that closer to the truth. That the is truth. closer to the truth. Okay. Yes. I do that know closer. that as an astronomer, as an astronomy teacher, as someone who's known as a writer about astronomy, I got I get questions about this many times a year. And when Mars is in opposition, I get them several times a week. Hey, Doc, I saw this thing on the web and is Mars really going to be as big as the full moon in the sky? And I always try to be patient and no, no, it's not. But I've dealt with this particular internet misconception or hoax, be it what it is, uh, for a couple of decades now. And so I posted my photo of Jupiter. And the way I posted this, I have the first two lines of my post said, Jupiter will appear as large as the full moon in the sky tonight. Your only chance this lifetime to see this, ancient scrolls predicted this unique event. And then because of the way Facebook does, then it says, see more. Then my, my picture appeared right below that. And if you click the see more button, then of course it, you sh it shows the rest of my post, which says, haha, just kidding, really? This is the moon, it's laminar clouds. This is why it looks this way. Right. And I said, you know, if you were teaching anyone casually, formally, this is a great exercise. Is this real? Is it fake? What is it? And of course, how do you know? And we've talked many times, Scott, education 21st century is about learn, believe, yeah. repeat the three yeah, word it's, it's learning to go work in a factory. Right. You know, like right? modern education is, is a factory. It's industrial education. Learn, yep. believe, repeat. Once you repeat, now you're smart. No, you're not. <laughs> How do you know? Uh, and uh, so I said, look, teachers, if you're going to teach critical thinking, this is a great thing. Put this up. Ancient scrolls say, is this true? How do you know? Have this discussion. My point with, with posting this out there was this is a great opportunity to teach anyone you come in contact with some critical thinking about how to evaluate what we see in astronomy posts and social media, any posts really, but astronomy is a particularly soft underbelly spot. Yes. Many people are interested, but very few people have the knowledge set necessary to sort true from fake and, uh, Maybe this would be a great time. Tell us, Scott, what's the origin of that original? All right. So, so in, there, there was a group of uh, planetary amateur, but but very respected planetary uh, imagers. Um, uh, one of them was the legendary Donald Parker. And, oh, okay. Uh, right. And so Donald Parker was being interviewed in a I don't know if it was AP or you know one of the oh. one of the big news. Uh, uh, organizations and what he said was that the moon or that that uh, mars will look as big as the moon does to the naked eye through a telescope at 100 mag magnification okay so he was taking the perceived angular size okay of of the 
you know, I can't remember how many arc seconds it was, right. um, right. times 100, okay? And Gives that you, uh, you, know, if you could somehow seconds. look at the, the, the moon yeah. with the, you know, right. through one eye and then your other eyes on Mars and you could get them to converge, they would appear to, to you That's, to look about the same size. Yeah, that idea. makes a lot of sense. Mars at opposition is about eye. 25 arc seconds. A hundred times would give you about uh, half a degree. Right. Which, which he's right on the money. Right. And so that got distilled down to Mars is going to be as big as the full moon. Okay. <laughs> Into the, the email that we all know and love. Um, Dropping off a couple of important details along. The yeah. Just, you know, so. <laughs> But it would come out every year. I mean, so, you know, routinely such an extraordinary like event if it was going to happen every year, like like Christmas or something. So, yes. right. You could depend on it. There you go. But, um, at least you could depend on that email. And it came out for, geez, I'm going to say eight or nine years or something in a row, you know. Gotcha. And we would get phone calls oh. and customer service. Scott, did you know? They would tell me, Scott, did you know that, you know, that Mars is going to be as big as the full moon. Aren't you excited? You know, and we're, we're only two weeks out from the time it's supposed to happen. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, yes. and then I would have to explain it to them and they would be really disappointed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> especially when they called me sometimes with such authority, you know, they would say, well, you know, this is, this is going to happen. Like teaching the teacher something new. Right? <laughs> if I can teach Scott Roberts something, or, or talk about something. I must be really you know, I'm clever. A, I'm a tech, you know. I can teach you how to use your telescope. But, but no, I'm not. I'm not a. Um, you know. You know. I'm not a scientist, Daniel. So, but I, I appreciate the scientific method. You know, and um, and and certainly uh, I knew a thing or two about the planets by that time. So, yeah. I I contend that on the day we purchase our first telescope unless we are very secretive, we become a science teacher. Oh, we become a star mentor. Maybe that's, to a degree. And, and that's, yeah. that's, that could that's be. the premise of my new book, Star Mentor, which I'm working on now, uh, going along great guns. So uh, I, will, I will keep everybody up to date. Um, I'm an annoyingly fast writer. Um, a lot of my editors don't like it. Uh, I started two weeks ago. I'm at about 45,000 words. So <laughs> now you're not just doing like talking into a microphone. Really oh, no, fast. no, like no. You're writing. I'm, okay. Yeah, I'm at about 45,000 words and about wow. 60 illustrations. And I do these, wow. you know, you guys know the kind of illustrations I do. I do these all myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but let's, let's take a look at something that I, uh, I bring up in all of my science classes. And I, I like to share this with people. When I set up a telescope and people wander up to you in the dark, ooh, is that a telescope? Can I have a go? Uh, you become a science teacher. You do. And uh, I, I think it's a great thing. A, a telescope is a party in a box. Set it up on a street corner and you have friends you never yes. knew coming up to you. That's right. Cells. You need more friends, add a puppy to the equation, you know, and you're going to have yeah, that one more. Oh, a puppy telescope and a, and a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> so... Something that I bring up, and I, I tell people this all the time, you, you hear this, I hear this, well, you don't know that for a fact, it's just a theory. You've heard that, haven't you, Scott? Oh, yeah, like somehow theories are way less than facts, Yeah, right? it's just, it's, 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 if a theory is just some kind of a, a wild-ass guess that you just right. made this up while you were in the shower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> wrote it down Most people don't really understand what a theory is. Precisely. And right? so I like to introduce people to the, I, the hierarchy of fact, hypothesis, theory. Facts are, are lovely <clears throat> details. They are demonstrably true. And true, truth and proof are slippery things too in science. But facts are things which are demonstrably true. Uh, I can say the earth is spherical. That's demonstrably true. Uh, and people will say, oh, Dr. Barthes, a spheroid is wider at the equator. And But these things are facts. We can measure them and we can, <clears throat> independent observers can measure them and agree. 
This object weighs 100 grams. This object occupies a volume, you know, the, the moon is 10 to the 22nd kilograms of mass. And the moon is 385,000 kilometers away. And this rock has a certain hardness on the Mohs scale. And this oxygen reacts with these other elements in these conditions and so on and so forth. Facts are these lovely things that we can know, we can share, and they are testable and provable. If I say, oh, oxygen reacts with hydrogen to form water, you don't have to take my word for it. Part of the beauty of science is I can put an idea out there and you, anyone, anywhere in the world, this planet or any other can make the experiment and verify my claim. This is a fact, it is true, but facts are really simple. They don't have <clears throat> they don't, by their nature, offer any connections to anything else. It's simply a thing that is true in isolation. And they are lovely, and without them, we go nowhere. But I like to make the analogy that theories are like cities and facts are like bricks. Okay, if you're going to construct a great city of many buildings, and pave the roadways, you need many, many bricks. It's the great thinkers are the architects who fit the facts together to make these lovely edifices that we call theories. So a hypothesis, Scott, and again, if we look at facts, are you familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, the taxonomy of learning? No, Maybe but you, is, you mentioned it in your in your Yeah, uh, Bloom's taxonomy, yes. Benjamin Bloom was a guy from the University of Chicago who was an educator and he studied education. And he put out this taxonomy, Bloom's taxonomy of cognition. The very lowest level, the very lowest, most basic kind of learning is recall. Do you know that Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun? You know, what is the crust of the earth made of? What are its primary? Right. And this factual recall. And when we are in school. Facts at the moment. I mean, right. the moment the IAU decides that Pluto is now really a planet, and so is Quayar and all and these others, will. then, you know, yeah. Um, well, it's still the fifth. Right. <laughs> but unless you get, unless you get to series, until, we, until, series until planet, such right? time Mars gets as big as the full moon <clears throat> in the right. sky, right? Okay. So uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, these, these facts that we are taught to recall, everybody, anybody who's under 50, has gone through schooling. If you've been in school any time in the last 30 years, multiple choice tests have been the de rigueur standard. And kids today who are my university students coming up, and I'll ask them, okay, how many of you have practiced test taking? How many of you have spent many hours learning how to distinguish the distractor answer and throw it out? And you, how to psych out the test or how to, how to defeat the test, how to you know, how to perform smarter than you actually are. Mm -hmm. Because it's not what you know, it's knowing how to take the test. And virtually all of my students raised their hand. Yes, we spent many hours on this. And I said, why did you do this? Was it because test scores were important to you? And they all say, oh, no, it's because <coughs> the test scores are important to my school. When test scores are high, my school looks good and our, you know, I said, and your funding gets better. That's the part they didn't tell you. Oh, your right. test scores were worth money to your school district. Oh, and they all, the little light bulb goes on. Oh, that's why they, they beat us about the head and shoulders with this test taking skills so many hours, so many years. Yes. Well, facts are at a very low level. When we get to a hypothesis, Scott, a hypothesis is different. A hypothesis is something that is not just testable, it's falsifiable. Okay. This is a fundamental part of the scientific method that, again, we don't often teach. <clears throat> In order for it to be a good hypothesis, can you prove it wrong? My science students would always cringe when I said this. Hmm. I would always tell them, oh, make a hypothesis. Well, what if it's wrong? That's okay. That's a valid result. Good for you. You proved it wrong. You advanced the cause. 
but they had all been trained, conditioned like Get everything analogs, correct. Analogs, that a wrong answer was a terrible thing. And yeah. you were dumb and you missed that question and you lost points and your grade went down. I said, no, science isn't like that. <clears throat> I did a, uh, I did a, a stretch of work, an internship for uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture during the 80s. And I spent about a year working with two kinds of corn fungus. One made vitamin C when it uh, grew on corn. The other produced a toxin called aflatoxin, which killed livestock and gave you liver cancer. It was really nasty stuff. But when they grew together, no toxin. So if your corn was contaminated with both fungi, no toxin, and you could feed it to pigs and cattle and they could eat it and they would be okay. So we were wondering, why does this happen? Because obviously if you could knock off this toxin or make the corn immune or grain immune to this toxin, that's worth billions of dollars commercially. Livestock, people, right? It's an important thing. I tested 14 hypotheses in the course of a year. Mm. Every one of them was false. And uh, you're getting closer to something that you can work with. It's kind of like indeed, um, indeed. But as a young man in my early 20s, yeah, doing this as part of my bachelor's degree in field biology. I was frantic and I went back to my advisor and I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to graduate now. <laughs> and uh, she assured me, no, no, uh, this is a valid part of science. Science learns from its mistakes, not just from its successes. So a good hypothesis, you have to be able to prove it false. And in fact, you can never prove it true. To prove it true is requires testing all things through the whole universe, through all time, and it's just not Possible. doable. Yeah. So you, you can't prove a hypothesis true. You can say, ah, and this is where people say, oh, scientists are such weasels. You ask them if it's true, I ask <laughs> my doctor, will this, will this cure my rash? And the doctor says, well, yeah, it has a pretty good chance. It has a 96%. No, no, no. Will it cure my rash? And um, this is something that people don't understand about science. We gather evidence in support of a hypothesis. We can never prove it true. We can only prove it false. This is at the very core of the geocentric, heliocentric Aristotle versus Copernicus and Galileo tag team wrestling match that went on for centuries. You know, Aristotle and Ptolemy in this corner, Copernicus and Galileo in that corner. And the Aristotelians, the Earth-centered fixed Earth people, as their measurements got better, they would tweak the theories and adjust it. Ptolemy, of course, went from purely Earth-centered to epicycles and deference. And the, the Earth-centered theory got crazy complex. Hmm. And they kept on tweaking it. Oh, this year we've got an error of Jupiter. It's off that way. Okay, if we tweak... The numbers are, are, but no matter how they tweaked it, it was kind of like sitting on a jelly sandwich. Well, okay, the jelly kept squirting out the other side. Have you ever eat, you've eaten a jelly donut, haven't you, Scott? No matter uh, where you yes. get in, the once jelly comes twice, out somewhere now you else. I did have stuff squirt out <laughs> one side and of my mouth. So. This is what yeah. was happening with the uh, with the geocentric theory, and this this tweaking and adjusting went on for almost two millennia. Yikes. Oh my gosh, people were doing this for almost 2000 years. They were tweaking this theory. Copernicus comes along and he resurrects. He doesn't invent, but he resurrects an idea. Oh, the sun is in the center. The earth is a planet. So the so earth who indeed, comes up? Who, who is? Oh, who it was Aristarchus of Samos. Or was there? Was there Aristarchus of Samos, who was a, well, at least from this far away in history, a relative contemporary of Aristotle. Okay. Um, and he came up with the idea that the sun was in the center, but his argument was religious rather than practical or astronomical. He said, well, if I were a God, where would I yeah. put the sun yeah, put it right in the put middle, right? to light the room in the middle, of course. So his idea was the gods put the sun in the center to light all of the cosmos equally. I see. If you had one flashlight and you wanted to light a whole room or one candle, where would you stand in the middle of the room? Of course. 
His ideas were aesthetic and religious. Copernicus came back and said, no, this makes sense mathematically. Mm, that's different. The other thing that was different is instead of tweaking the model every time you wanted to explain another fact, Copernicus found that, oh, when you put the sun in the center, all sorts of things fall out quite naturally. Oh, the earth rotates on its axis, mm -hmm. day night cycle, boom. Of course, it's natural. You don't have to adjust the model or explain that. The whole cosmos doesn't have to explain it. The earth itself is sufficient. Oh, we have seasons. Oh, the axis tilted toward and away from the sun. Ah, all this requires is, oh, this is, this is simple, it's easy. Oh, well, why is the ecliptic 23 and a half degrees off of the celestial equator? Oh, well, boom, the Earth's axis is tilted. Uh, and retrograde motion, the idea that the cosmos is a lot larger than we thought. Oh, stars can be other uh, entire solar systems. And we learned, I discussed a couple weeks ago, Giordano Bruno, uh, who was a contemporary of Copernicus in 1600, was burned at the stake for the many worlds hypothesis. Other stars or other yeah. star systems. Wow. Uh, I was actually uh, smacked with a ruler and sent to the principal in Catholic school as a young man for saying, no, there are other solar systems and there's likely planets and life there. There are none. It's said, better than being burned at the stake. Said the nun. Uh, and uh, no, this is, this is, and she was very much an Aristotelian and not a Copernican. This is the one unique place in creation. The whole Copernican hypothesis, the Copernican principle is what it's called now. If your model requires that the thing you're studying is special, the earth is special, the earth holds a special place, it's a special motion, We've talked about this in many times. Yeah. If your idea, if your hypothesis holds that these conditions need to be special and unique, you're almost certainly wrong. Copernicus has won every bout, every test of the Copernican principle has shown that he was correct. That the idea that the earth is in the center, it holds a unique place in the cosmos. Every time we've had this idea that something is unique in the cosmos, we've most certainly been incorrect. Uh, I was told there are no other planets. And I argued, you don't know that. You can't know that. It only makes sense. But remember we were taught, I don't know if you were taught this, Scott. Planets were formed when two stars passed by and the gravitation ripped some material off of one star, which became planets. Remember being taught I, that? I, I remember the idea. Remember that sure. hypothesis? Sure. And stars are so far apart. This is so rare. There are maybe 10, plan 10 planetary systems in our galaxy. There can't but we still be. didn't know. We didn't, we didn't know. know. Because this was in hypothesis. We had, without, we had not yet found other planets. There was no evidence for this. Mm -hmm. It was it was an exercise, and uh, no one has seen it happen. So it wasn't falsifiable. So it wasn't a legitimate scientific hypothesis. It wasn't falsifiable. Mm. Uh, and so you get this idea that hypotheses must be falsifiable. You must be able to prove it wrong. <clears throat> and Copernicus's idea went on from about 1570 until 1610. So uh, quite a number of decades, and it was past Copernicus's lifetime before anybody gathered evidence to actually show <clears throat> that the Earth-centered hypothesis was wrong. Galileo said, yes, it must be true. It's beautiful, it's elegant, it's mathematically much simpler. It must be true. He was going, he was arguing from Occam's razor. The simpler hypothesis is almost always correct. The final coup de grace of the Earth-centered hypothesis was observing the phases of Venus. And uh, I believe we did a program on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and phases of Venus showed motions and changes that were not possible in an Earth-centered system. It could not happen. The Earth-centered system said, this is impossible. Galileo's telescope says, this is what happened. And so the evidence was finally found to not prove Copernicus correct, but to finally prove Aristotle and the Earth. Some people were wrong. And that's why Galileo was sent to jail for the rest of his life. So this hypothesis idea fits in between facts. A hypothesis is based upon facts. 
And a hypothesis is really, these are how these bricks fit together. Remember the analogy of the fact is a brick? Hypothesis is, oh, this is a diagram. I can put these bricks together and it will make a lovely house and it won't fall down, right? The hypothesis says these right. are the connection between facts. A theory, Scott, is something much grander. It's not a house, it's not a cathedral, it's a whole city. A theory is an entire system of knowledge. It's often a lifetime accomplishment of an individual. Although today, 21st century science, it's more like uh, a collaboration, a cast of thousands. The uh, paper of the discovery of the Higgs boson okay. has over 1,200 co-authors. Wow. Yeah, it gives a whole new meaning to et al. <laughs> Which, by the way, friends, that's et al is uh, what you put on a paper if you're citing and the whole rest of the boys in the band, everybody in the crowd, right? Right, uh, a lot so, of et al's there. <clears throat> Copernicus indeed did his work pretty much by himself. So did Galileo, Newton. We get up Darwin still doing stuff by himself. Einstein certainly did stuff by himself. But you get past Einstein. And you get into the era in mid 20th century and science becomes very expensive, much more complex. It becomes a collaborative effort. Very rarely, I'm trying to think if we've had people who have made great scientific discoveries working on their own. I know math still works like this. Uh, the fellow who proved Fermat's last theorem did it by himself. Uh, crazy 800 page proof, something like that. But science usually isn't done this way. Vera Rubin, I think, discovered dark matter pretty much on her own. But even so, she's working at a facility with big telescopes funded by a whole crowd of people. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not a dilettante's uh, endeavor anymore. It's, it has to be at least crowdfunded. And so this theory, what does a theory do? A theory explains all the facts we know about a certain area of knowledge and how all of them link together. A theory is this wonderful grand thing that, oh, you wanna know about particle physics? Let me introduce you to the standard model. And this explains everything we know. Well, Caveat, almost everything. What a theory also does, and it's just as important as explaining what we know, a theory says, and oh, by the way, here's the places where the bricks don't fit. The crack between what we expect and what we observe is the crack through which we see the rest of the universe. That is the crack that lets in the light. And I take Newton and Einstein as an example here. The French actually were pissed with the English. They wanted some people in the French government wanted to go to war because the English refused to declare that Newton was divine. No one could have this great an understanding of the cosmos, unless they were some kind of godlike, godlike figure. And there was, <clears throat> there was a great movement in France to declare Newton was some sort of a divinity. And Newton, I'm sure, hated the idea. <laughs> His religious <laughs> ideas were not uh, orthodox in any way, shape or form. And the English, oh, talk, talk, we can't do that. Uh, the English didn't, didn't take to that. But Newton's system was so powerful that no one made a single correction to it for three and a half centuries. And this wasn't from Aristotle to Kepler. This was in the era of the Enlightenment and the era of invention. And why is Einstein famous? Einstein is famous because he made a minor, relatively minor correction to Newtonian gravitation that only applies in very certain circumstances where you have really big masses or really large speeds. But if you want to get to Mars, you're really not paying attention to Einstein. You're following, you're taking your cues from Isaac Newton. Uh, it was the Apollo 
uh, eight astronauts when they were flying to the moon to circle and come back. Mm -hmm. And someone asked, well, who's piloting the spaceship? They were on the air at the time. And uh, one of the fellows laughed and said, I think it was Jim Lovell. He said, I believe Isaac Newton's driving right now. <laughs> he was quite correct. He was quite correct. Isaac Newton was driving. And so these theories have this marvelous, you're talking about a life work. We named theories after people. The Higgs boson is a theory of gravitation and how gravitation forms, named after the scientist Higgs, of course, uh, relativity. And we have Newton's theory of universal gravitation, Einstein's theory of relativity, Darwin's theory of natural selection. These theories are these tremendous lifetime achievement works. These are the things that get you in a textbook that make you remembered throughout history. It's not an individual discovery. You might discover a new bone uh, that says, ooh, here's a new species of dinosaurs. Uh, the Alvarez father and son team, and I believe it's George Alvarez and his son, uh, forgive me if I'm getting the first name wrong, but they discovered the iridium layer around the earth. And they said, ah, they went from this to the lovely theory that, uh, gee, it was a massive impact that caused a mass extinction on the earth. This idea that, and this is only 15 years, it's 15 years after Gene Shoemaker proves that yes, meteors can make impacts in craters on earth. And the Behringer crater is indeed, as Daniel Behringer called it, a meteor impact crater back in 1930. And he was poo-pooed by the scientific establishment. Gene Shoemaker went and found evidence he was correct. And Dan Behringer had a hypothesis. Gene Shoemaker came forward with a theory, ah, impacts do cause the surface of a planet to be reformed and shaped. And we've been gathering evidence to support Shoemaker's theory of planetary resurfacing by impactors for the last half century more, 60, 50, 60 years. The same way Alvarez's are not remembered for discovering the iridium layer. They're remembered for this theory, cometary impacts causing mass extinctions or in impactors causing mass extinctions. It's the idea of a theory that is grand and beautiful. And again, you have this idea now, oh, here's what a fact is, here's what a hypothesis, here's what a theory is. And you hear some, oh, that's not a fact, it's just a theory. You're never going to hear a prouder <laughs> public declaration of scientific ignorance in your right, life. Right, right, right. And you will hear also the term, well, that's just your theory, right? Yeah. Like, that you don't know, that's just your theory. theory. <laughs> Which means that people don't yeah. understand what a theory is. They don't. Right? Swing and a miss, as the baseball <laughs> people would say. So uh, we learn to understand. We, we test these models. But when we talk about models, Scott, we, I, something that I say all the time, and again, I get flack for this, all scientific models lie. And I say this as an educator because it shocks people. And I learned a long time ago that if you want to teach people to think in a new and innovative way, you've got to stop the old way like a train wreck. Mm. I would always start out my physics classes by teaching my students that five times five was 20. Okay. <laughs> and they would How go, did that go, no, it's not. I'm like, you've been lied to. Five times five is 20 and I can prove it. Mm. And no, you can't. Look at my calculator. And they would get out there, look at my calculator five times. I was 25. I'm like, liar. And then we would go into a discussion of significant figures. I said, math uses numbers, science uses measurements. Measurements have a limited amount of accuracy. Five, one digit, five, one digit. Can your cake ever be better than the eggs and flour and sugar you put into it? If your flour is moldy, you're going to have a good cake. No, you're not. So your answer in, math, in science can't be more accurate than the data you put in one digit one digit five times five rounds off to 20 because that's all the accuracy you know you don't have enough knowledge to say 25 
5.0 times 5.0, that's 25. And so five times five equal 20 became kind of the secret password and club handshake for all of my physics and engineering students. I'm like, don't forget to tell your math teacher. I must say my math teacher colleagues hated me hated robustly you. and consistently <laughs> for years. But my science students stopped thinking about math as a way to handle numbers. Ah, math is a tool that lets us manipulate measurements to learn about the world. It's a different mindset, but it's essential if you're going to do science and understand it. And so uh, when we see all models lie, we have to understand when a scientist or an astronomer, an engineer, anybody creates a model, some of these are mathematical, but I'm gonna focus on the physical model. And I go, ooh, okay, mm -hmm. here's, my, here's my model. And I know I've shown these on the program before, but here's my model of the earth and moon. And we've done little activities. Ooh, you can see moon phases and stuff like that. And people go, well, wait, the moon isn't the same size as the earth and they're not on little plastic pedestals and on and on. And I go, yeah, I know, but one side's dark, that's night. One side's bright, that's day. And look, we can set them on the table and manipulate them. And voila, we don't have to explain anything. The phases of the moon appear naturally when you manipulate the model. That's what the model is for showing how the phases of the moon work. Is it for showing the relative distance between the earth and moon? No. Their size and scale? No. And so scientific models always have a particular purpose. And scientists like myself take our models and we go, oh yeah, the earth and the moon, oh yeah. The earth and Mars, look, they're the same size. Well, I'm making them out of ping pong balls, damn it. So of course they're the same size. and. <laughs> I'm only building a model to explore one or two particular details. And I'm making many simplifications and I'm making many omissions of things that I don't consider important. Well, when am I gonna put those things back in? When I realize there's a need for them. When my model isn't working because something isn't working, then I go back and say, ah, what essential must I put in that I've left out? Isn't this what Copernicus did? Why isn't this damn geocentric model working? Oh, I know, I need to change something and see if it works better. We only make models as complex as we have to. Now, that's fine for the people who are making that. You know, brilliant scientist in the lab is making a model of how DNA folding works on her computer and the DNA model shows dots and sticks, right? A, dot, a stick and ball model, mm -hmm. like Watson and Crick did for DNA in the 50s. Well, she doesn't need to know other things to tell her how protein folding works. Doesn't need it. So she leaves it out. Oh. And yet, if you take this model and you hand it to somebody else and you say, oh, look, here's a model of the Earth and Moon, and you're not there to explain, Here's the simplifications I've made. Here's the things I've done to make this easier for you. That important detail gets lost. And so we get, and I'm going to show you some things, Scott, that I know, I know will be familiar to you. So I'm going to show, share a screen again and show some various things. Here we go. <clears throat> and look what we have here. Have you seen this, this uh, diagram, Scott? Yes. You've seen this. So are there eight moons? Are there 16? Are they all stationary in space? Is the moon moving? Which way does it go? <laughs> and oh, I see direction of sunlight. Where's the sun in this diagram? Is the moon's orbit really a circle? I've heard that they're all ellipses. And you know what? Models like this, as brilliant as they are, they are just designed to develop misconceptions, especially when you have someone who is not thoroughly trained in astronomy, mm -hmm. presenting them to children or beginners, you know, that interested person who comes up to you in the dark, is that a telescope? Can I ask a question? And I've had people, 
do this before. And I, now in the year of smartphones, I've had people come up and say, can I show you this on my smartphone? I had this in my science book at school. It can't be true. There aren't 16 moons in two rings around the earth. I'm like, yes, you're correct. And so we take a look at these, these photos, Scott, uh -huh. and we, we look at these things and we see stuff like, oh, here's another one. Ooh, you can oh, yeah. see five planets. That's what I want tonight. See. That would be a, so much easier to study the planets if it was like Wouldn't that. It? I wish I had a kick butt telescope that would show me these views. And here's another one. Oh, look, here's the Earth setting. Now, this, this particular diagram was put out by JAXA, the Japanese uh, oh, Space yeah. Agency. Right. And what they're showing is, oh, here's what it would look like if you were in a spacecraft orbiting the Earth. But the image makes it to the internet without that. And people get the idea that the Earth sets on the lunar horizon, just like the moon sets on Earth. And it doesn't. The moon is tidally locked. One side faces the Earth all the time. If you were there, wherever the Earth was in the sky, that's where it would always be. It would change phases. You would see it rotate on its axis, but it wouldn't move in the sky. And we look at uh, other things. Oh, here's a photographic image, and this is a real image taken through a telescope. Uh, this is Jupiter, and it's being eclipsed by the moon Io. There's Io's shadow. And I, I'm familiar with these sort of photos. I've looked at these sorts of things through my telescope. Oh, look, there's going to be the shadow of Io is going to pass across Jupiter. Yeah, it's cool. And so NASA puts up this photo and somebody posted it on the web. And I said, that's fake. The shadow of Io is not that big. Right. And they said, no, it's not. It's a NASA photo. And yeah. Juno space probe. I ended up having to eat my words. Why? Juno doesn't take a square rectangular photo. Juno exposes a round image on its sensor. And this round image is a portion of Jupiter where they're focusing in and magnifying just that area of the surface of Jupiter, I see. which has the shadow of Io. And because of the fisheye distortion, you get some of the curvature. And I'm like, no, this looks like a bad special effect from a 2001 movie, you know? It's like uh, um, seeing pictures of the Earth shot with old right. drones you know they had that fisheye effect so you could right. see what looked like the curvature of the earth right and yeah. here's our favorite the moon oh, and yeah. mars oh the moon will look and i didn't yeah. have to look very far to see this find Every this one august we would have this yeah <laughs> there it is and uh then we've got stuff like this oh here you go oh that's a real photo no it's not well, how do you know? Right? That's the question. That's why we're here. Well, many of our viewers, I'm sure, know that the moon is a half a degree wide, roughly. Yeah, I know, apogee, perigee, it changes a little bit, but the moon's about a half a degree wide. And if you hold up your thumb, it's about half the size of your thumbnail. It's about the size of an aspirin tablet at arm's length. Well, if that's how big it is, then... Can you get the moon to look really big? Sure you can on the horizon if you take a telephoto shot. Oh, there's a tree or a house three miles away. There's a the moon next to it lens. on the horizon. You're, you're and half a mile they're away. both half a degree in the field of view. Can you get far back enough behind your head to have your hands look half a degree wide and have that amount of detail on them? No. No, you can't. <laughs> I've tried. Yeah, here's another one. Oh, and this is a fake too. If you're far enough back from the Statue of Liberty that it's only half a degree wide in your field of view, can you get this kind of detail on it? I can tell you, I, this one, uh, I've not had anybody verify it, but I, I suspect very strongly this is a fake. Uh, if you wanna see the moon on a cityscape, here you go. This one's genuine, why? The picture of this building, I think this is Seattle or maybe it's Chicago, hard to tell. Uh, but this building is shot from several miles away so that both building and moon are half a degree wide. And look at the amount of detail you can get. 
If that were the Statue of Liberty, would you be seeing wrinkles in the robe? No, you would not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you get all these wonderful things and many artistic, many artistic things. And some of the things that are actually accurate look fake. Here's a uh, diagram of the moon and the earth. And this one lies too, because if we look at this diagram and it says, oh, relative sizes and distances are not to scale. Why not? Well, the moon is 30 diameters away, right? The moon is 30 diameters away and one quarter the size of earth. If we're gonna make earth this big, 30 diameters would not fit on our computer the page. If we're gonna make the earth 1 30th of the diameter, the moon is a dot and this umbra becomes a line. Mm -hmm. And of course the sun, psh. so is it an accurate diagram showing how- There the sun's it, just a little bit bigger than the earth, right? So Yeah, exactly. Does it show how the umbra tapers down to make a very small place on the earth? Why is the path of totality only 50 to 70 kilometers wide? Well, because the shadow of the moon is very tiny. At that distance, it shows those things. It shows the umbra is much smaller than the penumbra, the place penumbra being where we see a partial eclipse. And it shows some things that are really good to know, but it makes distortion. So when we look at social media and when we look at any model whatsoever, we have to ask ourselves, okay, what simplifications did the designer of this model, the scientist, what simplifications did he or she make? What things were omitted? What is this supposed to demonstrate and what was ignored? <clears throat> This is something that I do all the time. I take people and go, oh, okay. Uh, we're going to make a model of the earth and moon. And we get out a baseball and we get out a basketball and we get 30 feet of rope and we go outside in the grass and we take little, the little agriculture flags, right? The mm -hmm. people use for gardens. And we have people walk out and we mark out how far the moon moves every day. G28, we divide the circle into 28 segments and we space this out and people's first response is, oh my God, the moon's orbit is huge. The yeah. moon is such a tiny thing lost in this great big space. How do we ever get a spaceship to hit that darn thing? <clears throat> and it's moving. Oh, look, seven days takes us a quarter of the way. Is that why it's a quarter? And we start putting out the phase, the little card with the phases, hold this up. And people are like, oh my gosh the real scale of things. And I said, do you understand now why you can't put this on a piece of paper? And somebody said, wait, I want to get far enough back with my cell phone and take a picture. From far enough back, it just looked like a bunch of people standing in a circle for some strange ritual. It didn't look like a science class activity at all. And so we always have to bring to the table something of what we know, including some healthy skepticism. Does this seem real? How far away is, in terms of my original picture, how far away is Jupiter really? What's its size? Do a little trig, it's not hard. How big would Jupiter appear in our sky? Does this make sense? Are the shadows right? <clears throat> oh, if the moon is here, oh, it's showing the moon. Can you spot waxing crescent from waning crescent? Does it make sense, you know, what you're looking at? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we can bring some reasonable skepticism and we can get a lot more out of the models that we do have that are legit and we can more easily spot fakes, but it's important to teach these critical skill, thinking skills. Most of the teachers I presented this to were claps, thumbs up, love this, I'm going to use this as a bell ringer for opening my class to get him to start thinking. The response from the astronomy community was much more <laughs> derogatory. Mm. Right down to somebody who said, oh, F you. Gosh. <laughs> no, people were really like foul language, awful. And I'm like, guys, you know, uh, this is supposed to be 
and exercise in thinking. And then all the comments about, oh, the moon's not orange because they're harvesting hay where you're at. It's because of the, and <clears throat> all sorts of things about, I saw Jupiter in my binoculars and that's not what it looks like. If that's Jupiter, where are the moons? I'm like, guys, whoosh, you're missing the point entirely. Got a hole in their glove. Kind of, kind of. Uh, there's a hole in my glove. I didn't catch that one. So <laughs> take it for what it is. The idea is to learn about facts, hypotheses, theories. How are they different? How do we bring some of our knowledge to the table when we look at things on the web? And when we're out with our telescope in the dark and somebody comes up and says, hey, can I ask you a question? How do you know the moon is round? How do you know you're really looking at Mars? How do you know those moons go around Jupiter? We can think about, gee, if I'm going to give them an analogy or try to explain with a model or, you know, scratch a little drawing in the dust at my feet with a stick, we want to think about, oh, how are we going to model this for somebody else? How are we going to give information without setting off misconceptions? And it's important for all of us to think about these things. Hmm. Uh, because sometimes people make legitimate mistakes. Sometimes theories and hypotheses are thrown to have theory, serious misconceptions in them or errors or holes or things they didn't account for. That's how science progresses. But we need to be more conscious when we consume this fire hose of media that comes through our tablet, computer, and smartphone screens every day. So I'm hoping that's what our audience will take yeah, away today, Scott. And you need to develop a, a litmus test to, um, to measure uh, everything, every, everything you're learning about astronomy. You know, certainly so. come to it with a critical yep. mind. Do we have any fun right. questions or comments today? This is always my favorite. Lots of interesting comments here. Um, let's see. Um, of course, our you know, our, our group of followers that, that uh, often uh, chat here with us, I'm, I'm sure there's others that are just watching and never chat, but it's nice to hear them chat. Um, they, uh, they, they've made friendships and connections of their own, which is really cool, you know. That's awesome. Right? Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, uh, some of the comments were, let's see, let me find a couple of good ones here. Um, let's see. Martin Eastburn says, I caught mine in the trees of Jupiter for something a bit higher and bright. It looked like a clover leaf. Okay, not, didn't look like Jupiter, it looked like a clover leaf in the sky. Um, uh, that, that may be the source of uh, UAPs and stuff like that too. <laughs> Who knows? Um, Let's see. Um, Book Davies of Mars would have to take a big left to turn to appear as big as the moon. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, Andrew Corkill says he's a secret scientist. Yes. Oh, brilliant. He's keeping it to himself, I guess. <clears throat> um, Norm Hughes just saying hello, which is great. Um, Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Um, Book Davy says, I'm sort of a scientist. I'm a nurse, but I practice astrophysics in my off time. He is absolutely. <laughs> Book, you are absolutely That's a scientist. Right. That's right. The day we start to wonder and then try to find out, we become a scientist. The day we start to explain what we've learned to someone else, we become a science teacher. And... Very few of us are paid to do this, but millions upon millions of us engage in this activity to the best of our ability. And it's, it's brilliant and it's wonderful. And I want to I wanted just uh, wrap up here, Scott, with sure. baby's comment on Mars. That's uh, very uh, apropos. We're going to take the next few episodes of How Do You Know? And we're going to focus in on Mars, but not just Mars the planet. We're going to focus in on the search for life on Mars. Uh, and we've seen, if you've been following the social media from NASA, Perseverance begins its hunt for the evidence of life on Mars. We're going to kind of take the next few programs and take a look at how we know what we know. Uh, how did we get from Mars, the dying planet of Percival Lowell's day, 
oh, Mars is a drying, dying desert planet with canals. And how do we get from there to the Mars we know today, which the Mars of the 21st century is worlds apart from the Mars of a century ago. And essentially, it's been a story of follow the water. Well said, worlds apart, the water. right? Worlds apart, yes. <laughs> I, that was deliberate. That was sometimes I just dribble these things out, but more often than not, these goofy little things are deliberate. So we're going to take a look in the next few uh, episodes, and I will, I will tell our viewers that I have hypotheses about this, uh, and some that have not been tested yet, and some that are not conventional thinking, and some that are not shared by hmm. the majority of the scientific community. But I'm going to put them out there. I'll take ownership for them, and uh, happy to do that. Uh, be happy to be proved right or wrong, but so far, a lot of these things uh, haven't been, they are interesting hypotheses, they are in principle falsifiable, they, there is not data to prove them right or wrong yet, and so we're going to take our viewers on this lovely journey over the next couple, three weeks, maybe a little more, following the search for life on Mars, and that's what we'll be doing on How Do You Know? Very cool. Very cool. Well, great. Thank you, Daniel. It was awesome. Uh, and we do look forward to the next, um, how do you know, which will be number 20. And, number uh, 20. Number 20 will be next Monday. So we'll have, to do a, um, we'll have to do a special uh, uh, 20th episode door prize or something that we can come oh, up with. So maybe, exciting. Daniel, you can come up with a interesting question uh, and uh, we can have the answers to that question go to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. We'll do the rules and stuff like that during the next show, but uh, that'll be very cool. So. Since we're, uh, we're talking about hypotheses, Scott, I will also offer a, uh, a future tense prize, a Ooh. signed copy of my upcoming book, Star Mentor. Well, there you uh, go. Awesome. So I'll offer a, and uh, guys, I'm still in the process of writing it. So you may be waiting a while, but uh, I trust me, like the search for, uh, life on Mars, the answer will be coming. <laughs> so right. we'll offer, I'll offer a, uh, a future tense prize. I'm hoping people are like, oh boy, oh boy, not, oh God, I'm going to have to wait for this. Like the, next, <laughs> the next season of my favorite TV show. That's right. Uh, That's right. But I'm a quick writer, so hopefully it won't be long. Very cool. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're just going to transition now and we're going to Annie uh, Scarborough. So I'll run her little intro here. You got to love that. I love so. that. <laughs> Well, let's let's uh, switch over to Annie. Uh, okay. She's going to give us updates on the Explorer Alliance and what's going on. And this I'll week. say good night, everybody. And All right, you. Daniel. You take care. <laughs> bye bye. Hey, Scott. Um, so, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Good. Because uh, my earbuds were acting a little crazy earlier. So, um, so we just still have that astrophotography contest. The Galaxies is running August uh, through August fifteenth. Um, and, um, we've already had some submissions start happening. So that's really good. Um, then we, you know, we, we've actually had some people order the crystal etched, uh, decor, desk oh, decor. So we, we've got, we've Wait. got those. Yeah. I think we've got, I got to count them in my head. Um, I think we might have seven left, I think. So there's only 10 of those total. Okay. So it was 10. It, there was 10 now yes now there's yeah. only seven so yep so you, if you want I'm one, not you selling better. mine I'm not selling <laughs> <laughs> that thing's staying on my desk okay so. <laughs> so and then we have the bino viewers we still have the, the that pre-ordered uh you can pre-order those um and then the events that we have are, you know, the Astronomical uh, League Conference, August 19th through the 21st, the Nebraska okay. Star Party, August 6th. Um, and then I just want to let everybody know, um, today I sat down with Scott and we are starting to get our calendar full. So just be looking at that calendar that we have yeah. on the website and you'll start seeing some things, some new yeah, things you pop up. Mm -hmm. If they're not familiar with it, I'll put uh, the okay. link. Just a second. 
So um, if you go to our website and just uh, hover over Explore Alliance, um, there's Explore Alliance Live and you click on that, it'll, and you scroll down, there'll be um, a calendar there um, with all of our stuff. And we try to hyperlink as much as we can. Um, I'm still working on getting some things corrected on there, but you'll start seeing, um, you'll start seeing quite a few new things that are going to start popping up on there um, yeah. and getting ready for. So um, we, uh, the Arizona dark sky party will be next year. And we've already started making plans for that. And um, this, uh, having 6 a special... PM star party with, at Mount Wilson. Yeah. That's next year. Yeah. And then we got the Starmus. Uh, I think it's a four Starmus four. Is that what it's called? I think so. Starmus is uh, going to be in Yerevan, Armenia. Yeah. So yeah. you'll have to get a plane ticket to um, go. But <laughs> you know, I've never been to Yerevan before. Um, looked at it on Google Earth and stuff like that. It looks very cool. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it. Um, but uh, Explore Scientific was asked to be the, um, you know, the honorary host of their star parties. So they're going to, you know, Starmus is a combination of uh, uh, astrophysics, uh, astronomy, and music. Okay, so you have people like Peter Gabriel and Brian May and, you know, a number of other, you know, high profile uh, musicians, but also high profile uh, physicists uh, will be there. And, um, but they're making a concerted effort to get more of the public involved and um, uh, amateur astronomers involved. And so that's, uh, that's why we're going to be there. And um, it should be an amazing event. That happens since I can't remember the exact date. Um, September. It's going to be September fifth through the tenth um, of okay. next year. So right. Um, so and we'll we'll get all that. We're, we're going to get all that stuff added to the calendar. Um, and then uh, nor the Northeast Astronomy Forum is going to happen in April of next year. Uh, the Winter Star Party is going to be the first event. It's going to at the beginning of the year, so it'll be January, the end of January through into February. Um, we have a new event that we haven't really. Um, I think we've been a part of it one time, the Stars and Sauce. Has it been one time? Do you remember? One time. Yeah, one time we did. Uh, we were, we were, uh, we unofficially participated. Um, okay. uh, this time it's a little bit more official, uh, but uh, some very enthusiastic uh, um, uh, people that are, they're not only concert promoters, but these people are really interested in astronomy as well. And so they again picked Explore Scientific to, uh, help them out with telescopes and, uh, um, you know, doing that stargazing part of this music festival, which lasts yeah. a couple of days. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah so we also in October had the International Observe the Moon yes. uh, yeah. night. And so we're, we're doing the kickoff uh, for that as well. So yeah. And then the, the, of course, the, the the Nebraska Star Party. So, I mean, the calendar is going to start filling up really fast. So next year, you know, even though even though we have COVID and stuff, some things are starting to get a little bit more back to normal. Yep. And so, um, so our calendar is going to start filling up, and so we'll be able to start getting out there and seeing our members and talking to them. And so it's it it's going to be exciting and it's going to be fun. And um, I hope that you guys pay attention and. And join us um, for the exciting things that are going to happen in 20, oh, yeah. 2022. So yeah. that's right. Yeah. So. And I don't know if we were real clear, but the Starmus event is September of 20, 2022. So yeah. 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 I think so most, I think most everything is um, that I've listed is 2022. Yeah. Um, Except the International Observe the Moon Night, which will be a yeah. virtual deal. But that's, yeah. again, that's a global thing. We can only do these global things uh, yeah. in the internet space. So, yeah. 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 so true. But yeah, so, so, but, but you got to plan ahead because like, like the Arizona dark skies, there's only a hundred, there's only a hundred spots. So if you, if, if you don't get on there and get your ticket, then you, you might not be able to get to go. So it's kind of. That would be sad. It would be very sad. Would be sad very you'd sad. have to wait in line. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, for the following year. So, yes, for the following year. Right. So. And, and the, the Mount Wilson event is also uh, very, very small. It's going to be 25 uh, tickets because oh, wow. yeah, that's so. all they allow inside the dome at the same time is 25 people. So, yeah. 
Uh, it'll be a very intimate, uh, very cool event. You know, we go to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, you know, there's all, there's so much to cover at JPL that they only said they when I plan tours like that, they say, Scott, what do you want to show them? Do you want to show the Mars yard? You want to do this? You want to do that? Uh, sometimes we're, you know, things are going on uh, where, uh, you know, a particular mission is so active, they don't even let us go in that particular area. Um, but almost every facet of the JPL uh, facility is really interesting and you will, you'll never forget it. Yeah. Um, Mount Wilson, you know, I've talked about it a number of times, how it's just steeped in history and and stuff. It's like you can feel the history, you can yeah. breathe it, you know, it's it's crazy. So, um, and as things get more um, developed with uh, Yerkes Observatory, we will also do a similar type of event at Yerkes. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of yeah. fun. And if things. you're not a member of the Explorer Alliance, you know, you can join for free as a legacy member. Uh, it's absolutely free. Uh, if you want some of the uh, more amazing benefits of Explorer Alliance, including Explore Care, uh, which covers all your product that uh, or gear that you might have gotten from Explore Scientific, whether it was branded Explore Scientific or not, because we do have other brands, they're all covered by this amazing um, advanced replacement type of program. So uh you know uh, it's it's not an extended warranty it's a member benefit called explore care and uh, you're going to want it so um also many of our you know our the discounts and the uh, you know special member discounts on things uh the limited edition things that we do um uh you know including the events there'll be of course discounts as you go there too so um you know, you're going to want to be one of these uh, members. So if you have any questions, you can send questions to Annie at Explore Alliance at ExploreScientific.com, uh, or you can jump on our web, uh, website and live chat with one of the customer service reps who can answer questions as well. But, uh, you know, it's our, our, our goal to uh, give you experiences that uh, would be hard to to put together on your own. Uh, you know, if we can do it, of course, others could do it, but uh, sometimes it's it's a little tough um, and it's it's more fun to do it in a group like the Explore Alliance uh, has. So with all you wonderful people. Yeah. So yeah. anything else you'd like to add before we call it a night? No, I think that's about it. I think, I think, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> You think we're there, huh? I think okay. we're there. I think we're there. <laughs> right. Well, Annie will be back tomorrow. So she she's going to be on regularly updating us on Explore Alliance because the uh, the membership base is growing a lot. Yeah. And um, uh, she is uh, staying quite busy with that. But, um, um, you know, uh, there's also so many other things that we want to talk about with Explore Alliance. So. You guys have a great night. Hope it's clear wherever you are. It's kind of partly cloudy here, but uh, maybe we'll see something out there tonight. Take care and keep looking up. Bye. Hey, before we go, I also wanted to mention to you that we have the 56th Global Star Party tomorrow night that will start at 7 p.m. Central, which is midnight universal coordinated time. So 
Um, you know, and the theme of this particular Global Star Party is our place in the universe. So we hope that you're there. Um, uh, you know, a lot of your favorite presenters will be on the program. And if you're interested in being part of the program, you have you can only uh, you don't have to go any further than to uh, send me an email to s at explorescientific.com or to explore alliance at explorescientific.com and we'll get you all signed up. So anyways, just wanted to bring that up before we go and uh, take care. Thank you.